Welcome to Hik Sunt Draconis. Here be dragons. And it is Superstar Sunday, where I take a look at a new individual every Sunday that has become famous for, well, being an idiot. So, I've recently been seeing a lot of people, again, starting to believe Bob Lazar. This could be due to the YouTube algorithm showing me these videos as I've been hunting down conspiracy videos looking for some comedy gold. However, I had thought this guy sort of disappeared into the archives of the internet, but I guess not. For those of you that don't remember, Bob Lazar claimed to have worked at Area 51, or a location called S4, where he reverse-engineered alien UFOs. His claims have never been backed up, and even his degrees, a master's in physics from MIT and another in electronics from Caltech, amazingly appear to not exist. He claims these were deleted by the government to discredit him. Maybe, maybe not. I'm not here to debate these things. Instead, I want to see how well his claims have aged now that physics has had some 30 plus years to mature. So, let's start with his description of the UFO power source. The power source is a reactor. Inside the reactor element 115 is bombarded with a proton, which plugs into the nucleus of the 115 atom and becomes element 116, which immediately decays and releases or radiates small amounts of antimatter. The antimatter is released in a vacuum into a tuned tube, which keeps it from reacting with the matter that surrounds it. It is then directed toward the gaseous matter target at the end of the tube. The matter, which in this case is the gas and the antimatter, collide and annihilate totally, converting to energy. The heat from this reaction is converted into electrical energy in a near 100% efficient thermoelectric generator. So, lots of very impressive sounding stuff about reactors, bombarding elements that have large numbers, using protons, getting antimatter, but read it again. <coughs> Antimatter and matter are converted into energy. Fine, that is what happens. But where does the antimatter come from? Well, from element 115, when it is bombarded with a proton by the Schiff's reactor, which turns it into 116. Okay, possible. But just exactly how much energy would your reactor have to put out in order to create an antiproton from 115? or rather convert 115 into 116, and then back. <clears throat> well, exactly the mass energy of an antiproton. And how much energy do you get back out when the antiproton annihilates? Exactly the same amount of energy that you put into it. You can never get free energy from nothing. You always get the same energy out of an object as what you put into it. This is just basic physics. And it's proven. It's never going to change. Really, you can't just make an antiproton by itself. You have to make a proton-antiproton pair. So your reactor needs to use two protons worth of energy to get one antiproton. So, in the best scenario, if you use the created proton-antiproton to create energy, you'll be getting a net energy output of zero. However, you're going to use more energy to power other systems than just the energy used to bombard the Muscovium with a proton. So, you are actually producing negative energy. Oh, wait a second. An Alcubierre warp drive requires negative energy to function. By God, I think he just... Uh, no, 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 no. That's not what we mean by negative energy. All right. We have a UFO engine that makes less energy than we put into it. Sounds like just another perpetual motion machine that doesn't work. What's next? This is how the reactor supposedly makes travel possible. This is accomplished by generating an intense gravitational field and using that field to distort space-time, bringing the destination to the source and allowing you to cross many light years of space in little time and without traveling in a linear mode near the speed of light. Wait. Wait, you use gravity to distort space-time, but uh, gravity is a distortion of space-time. Gravity also does one thing really, really well. It attracts all matter. You can't pick and choose which objects it has an effect on. If you were to generate a gravity field strong enough to bring the destination to the source, you're going to bring everything in the destination galaxy 
to the source galaxy. And bad things happen when stellar-sized objects try to occupy the same space. You know, a big bada boom. Now, there are serious scientists that do serious work on wormholes, warp bubbles, and other faster than light travel theories. Such as Harold White, and of course, most people are very familiar with Alcubierre. In fact, we just recently observed the very first warp field by accident, sort of. Warp would work by compressing space in front of a ship and contracting it behind the ship to sort of move itself. Not the object, but space itself. Therefore, it doesn't actually move faster than light or violate the laws of physics. But it doesn't use gravity at all, and it doesn't move things from one spot to another. It, it kind of moves space-time. And it uses negative energy. So, yes, Lazar was right in the fact that it is possible to warp space-time in a way, kind of. We kind of pinch it and squeeze it and stuff. But he was horribly wrong on how it can be done. And gravity is just not the answer in any way. So, Lazar does tend to confuse people when he talks about gravity. So... This is how he claims gravity works. There are currently two main theories about gravity. The wave theory, which states that gravity is a wave. And the other is a theory which includes gravitons, which are alleged subatomic particles which perform as gravity. Which, by the way, is total nonsense. Um, no. There is only one currently accepted theory of gravity, which is described as a distortion of space-time not as a particle or a wave. There are phenomena known as gravitational waves, which exist, and we do currently measure them. But this doesn't really seem to be what Lazar is trying to talk about. Lazar says that gravity is a wave. It isn't a wave. And the gravitons, which he speaks of, are a feature of quantum gravitational theories. And while there are currently no quantum theories of gravity that currently work, there's nothing at all nonsensical about gravitons. When an adequate quantum theory of gravity is formulated, the energy of the gravitational field will be quantized. This quantum of the gravitational field is what physicists will call the graviton. It is no more nonsensical than the photon, which is the quantum of the electromagnetic field. So, Lazar loves to talk about gravity A. Just what is gravity A? Gravity A is what is currently being labeled as a strong nuclear force in mainstream physics. Um, the strong nuclear force has nothing to do with gravity. Saying this shows a complete lack of understanding of the standard model of particle interactions. The equations which describe the two forces are totally different and unrelated. The strong force couples only to quarks and gluons. The gravitational force couples to all particles with mass. The strong force has a very short range. The range of gravity is infinite. The gravitational coupling constant in orders of magnitude smaller than that of the strong interaction. There is no basis for using the word gravity to describe the strong interaction in any way. So, either Lazar has found an entirely new model in which the two forces are really the same, having unified gravity with the other three forces of nature, or he's just straight up lying. Now, one glaring issue is that we can't find Muscovium, or element 115, in a stable form anywhere in nature. And he claims it is available in only certain galaxies. It should be obvious that a large, single star system, binary star system, or multiple star system would have had more of the prerequisite mass and electromagnetic energy present during their creations. When he says large, I think he means massive, because the physical size of a star says nothing about its mass. In 5 or 10 billion years, the Sun will be as large as the orbit of Mars, but it won't have more mass it'll probably have less. Stars change size over time. They don't gain mass, normally. He appears to be suggesting that his element 115, 
Muscovium, or the alien fuel source, which doesn't exist on the Earth for more than a split second and has to be made by humans in very specific ways, is present in stellar systems that were larger at their creation. So he is saying that a system created in a larger nebula cloud should have more heavy elements, such as 115. And that is completely wrong. Heavy elements, all elements heavier than iron, are not formed during the life cycles of a star. The only time when these nuclei are formed is during a supernova, which creates and then spreads them throughout the galaxy. So the amount of heavy elements isn't based on the size of the current star or size of the primordial cloud in which it was created but in nearby stars from the prior generation. All systems in a region of the galaxy will have the same amount of heavy elements and the same heavy elements. If element 115 is found in a stable form in some parts of the galaxy, as Lazar claims it is, then it should be created in all supernova, and it should exist everywhere. And it doesn't. Now, before people start saying, modern science could be wrong, Newton was wrong, Lazard could very well be right. Yes, that is correct, kind of. It doesn't mean that our current science will be wrong, either. We are constantly adding to our knowledge as we learn more, just how Newton's laws got replaced with Einstein's. Yet, Newton's laws still work. They are correct for what they were created to do, and will always be correct for that level of physics. We just expanded upon them. We will continue to learn many new things, and we will keep refining our science. But our current science will always be relevant and correct. The speed of light will always be the same. The number will just get more precise. The structure of an atom will always contain protons, neutrons, and electrons. That will never change, but we will continue to get more precise as to what is inside a neutron, proton, and electron. So, our science will never be wrong at a level to where Lazar is right. As all inventors of perpetual motion generators have found out, conservation of energy will always rise up to smack these people right back down to Earth where they belong. I would like to thank Dr. David Morgan for originally taking the time to bring up these issues. I know people try to question if Morgan even exists, but it doesn't matter. He could be a fake person. But his physics checks out and is still correct as of 2022, and they will always be correct. So, have a good weekend, and have a good day.